Hello, hello. Welcome into a brand new episode of Destination the Show, episode 15. Jamie Cameron back here as always with my guy Jeremy Nygaard and producer Theo behind the scenes. Jeremy, what's up, man? How are you? I'm good. You know, that that uh winter meetings, man, it just it's so exciting that you just it's hard to take it all in in one week. A freight train that could not be <laughs> derailed. Um do we expect too much out of the winter meetings or was that a particularly boring iteration of the winter meetings? I feel like every year gets a little more boring and a little less like it's all just kind of setting things up for the first domino to fall and and then you get teased by some things. I mean the Soto trade that was that was big. But that was like technically after we were done, right? And then Rodriguez signed after that too but yeah it was it was pretty boring so here's my question for you then if we're going to talk winter meetings quickly right off the bat do you think mlb needs to do anything to spice up the off season specifically free agency or just leave it how it is let fans do and don't mess with it well i think the only way that you could do that is if teams were up against the salary cap right i mean there's no there's no finite amount of money that's out there. And so team players know, right? If you want $100 million, someone's going to cough it up if you're good enough. Whereas mm-hmm. in, in the sports of the salary cap, once everybody's filled their rosters, it's like, sorry, there's no money left. And in baseball, there's money left. So I don't know that baseball can. Um, and I also think baseball is competing with the NFL in, oh. in win readings. And – the NFL is also, I mean, the NFL's king, right? But, and then you have the NBA in season tournament, which is also a, a thing now. Surprisingly entertaining. And so I, I just think MLB, they're, they're kind of up against the clock and they're up against all these other things. So, and it's, you know, the month between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So if you're going to do it, just, you'd have to push it later. And I don't know if yeah. that's, that would work any better either. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Um, although for Brewers fans, it was at least interesting. There was plenty happening. This is my smooth segue into circling back to Jackson Churio's extension locked in. We speculated on this last week. I think my guess was eight years, 90 million, um, ended up being eight years, 82 guaranteed with escalators up to a possible 10 years, 142 million um, if he were to get in the mix for MVP, uh, any any quick thoughts there? Um, like it for the Brewers? Yeah, I love it for the Brewers. I mean, you're 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 locking in one of the premier prospects in baseball. Which, mm-hmm. if he comes up and has a huge year, and you want to make this, you want to sign this deal a year from now, you're paying way more. Yep. Um, the one thing that was really um, of interest to me was how the the team was going to break this contract down. Right, because players make hardly anything in the first three years. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is a, a, it's still a huge amount of money. But in comparison to what a, f- a free agent's going to make, and if if you live up to the hype, you're making forty million dollars in your first year of free agency. Right? right. I mean, that's and you're making thirty five million in. Like, I think that Juan Soto is expected to get like thirty three in his third year of arbitration. Mm-hmm. Is that is that accurate? Um, so I just saw the breakdown here for the first time. He's going to make. $13 million in his pre-arbitration years. Okay. It's a huge amount of money. That's a good amount. To give a guy in pre-arb. Um, and then during his arbitration years, it is $32 million, which okay. is way less than what he would make if he were to go year to year. Now, this is a guarantee. He's guaranteed $82 million. He can make way more than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in his first potential free agent year now obviously he's he's not guaranteed a spot right so who, who knows when he's going to hit that service year but 16 million and then 17 million Man. so they're buying out two years of free agency for 33 million which is a great deal if he if he becomes a, a superstar and it's not so much money in 2023 that if he doesn't become a superstar that it's going to hinder them for because sure. At, at most, $17 million. And in 20, 2031, that might not even get you a number five starter. Yep. So I love the deal. I love it for the Brewers. Great deal. Love everything they did, did with it. 
For sure agree. Interested to see where the Brewers go from here, RE, their other kind of considerations and their more major league roster decisions. Will they hang on to Burns? Will they not? Um, I think it was asked and answered that Churio is not get any kind of guarantee of an opening day roster spot in 2023, which is as it should be, I think, from a team perspective. But yeah, that's that's an exciting one. I am jazzed to watch him for the next six, seven, eight years, man. It should be fun. For sure. Uh, Soto projected for $33 million this year. Um, newly minted Yankee Juan Soto. That is gross. I hope he shows up with a mustache and refuses to shave it off. Oh, terrible. Um, last, last kind of piece of news before we dig into the big two topics for the show today. Uh, Justin Willard. Minnesota Twins pitching coordinator hired away by the Red Sox this week. Um, I believe this is their third straight year having their minor league pitching coordinator hired away. Um, Certainly someone who seemed very well respected, um, had some folks kind of reach out and mention how much of a blow that would be to the organization. So my question for you, Jeremy, um is that more of a blow to the twins or more of a compliment and how well run their organization is i think it's it's a combination of both right and how well he's trained someone to take his job is probably what tips that scale one way or the other i mean any good leader is training the people underneath them to eventually either replace them or to take that job for somebody else, right? Bill Belichick is is well known for giving his coaches more responsibilities to one day eventually become a head coach. And it's you're going to lose those guys. Right. And I think that's that's you know, as a head coach, you want your assistants to be then ready to be a head coach. And so if you're not losing guys, it's because you're doing a horrible job, probably, and ho- doing a horrible job training them. And so I think it's it's both, right? It's going to be a blow because you've you've developed these people and then they leave, but at the same time, it's a compliment because it keeps happening, mm-hmm. and and teams around the league recognize that. And there's going to be somebody else that has been trained, you know, by Willard probably that just steps into that the same as Willard stepped into this this position that somebody else left for. So I it, when I heard it, I'm like, oh, that sucks because you you like continuity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, good good for him, good for the Twins, good for the Red Sox. It's, it's good for everybody. For sure. That'll that'll do it on kind of news and quick hits, man. So we're going to move into the bulk of our show today. And the winter meetings may not have been interesting for some folks. But for you and me, it was like Christmas. Uh, I feel like I'm so excited for this, man. This is I think us like tur- starting to turn the page, however much you might resist to the 2024 draft and 2024 draft content. So the draft lottery took place on Tuesday. Um, so we're in Nash and uh, Theo saying most boring winter meetings ever. Um, fair. I don't just, dis- I won't dispute that. Draft lottery is on Tuesday. We're going to spend some time on there. There's a lot to kind of cover. So we're going to split this up into three chunks, right? I'm going to, I'm going to give some like headlines of the lottery. You're going to walk us through comp picks um, because those were announced during the winter meetings also. And then we'll try and summarize it and tie it in a bow, right? And say, here's the implications for each team's draft bonus pool. Like if the draft were today, um, and, and we'll dig into some listener questions that folks asked along the way. Um, so let's take before, before you yeah. start, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I was, I was in a gym on Tuesday at four 30. Okay. So I didn't, I just saw, I Good got for a, you. no need to show off. I got an alert that says, you know, what happens? How was it as a television viewer? You, I'm sure you watched horrible, it. horrible. <laughs> it was absolutely horrible for several reasons. <laughs> Number one, they had Brad, Brad Paisley, country music artists, like, and now, okay. Some dude in a cowboy hat. Someone will correct me. They moved along really fast. And then here was here was the crazy part, dude. And we'll get into this when we do the headlines. 
they didn't make it clear from the jump that three teams might end up dropping multiple spots. And so the names of those teams, the Mets, Padres, and the Yankees, was left on the board as we got into the upper picks. And so unless you were really in tune with the ins and outs of how that works, I know for a fact that there were folks even like well-versed in the draft who thought the Mets might have secured a lottery pick when in fact it was clear from the jump that they had um, fallen due to luxury tax implications. So it was very confusing. So what did they, what did they start with the picks at? Like what was the first pick they revealed? 18, I think, because it starts outside of the playoff places and the other for, for they start where um, they start right outside the playoff places, right? So every team who didn't make the playoffs is where they start. And then the other confusing piece here is they actually do the draw in advance. They do the ping right. pong ball part like at one thirty, and then they announce yep. it at four thirty. And right. so the crazy part that some people may not even be aware of is spoiler alert. The guardians have the number one pick. They right. actually didn't win the lottery. The Washington Nationals won the draft lottery, but they are ineligible to pick inside the top nine because they're a large market team and they had a lottery pick last year. I don't think they should be complaining too much because they got Dylan Cruz out of that deal. So the Nationals won. They picked 10th. Cleveland and Cincinnati, I think, of the story. The state of Ohio is the story. Both had minuscule odds and they are picking first and second overall. I think Cleveland had like a 0.5% chance of going first overall, something absolutely ridiculous. Um, so after Cleveland won, is it, didn't Washington get picked? In? They did. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They had like five or six draws. It was very confusing. That's a great baseball America article. JJ Cooper wrote, um, I encourage folks to go, go check that out. The details, like all of the drama, um, around the ping pong ball drawer that happens, you know, a couple of hours before. Um, so, so here's the headlines. I think that people need to know Cleveland and Cincinnati are picking first and second overall. The White Sox and Athletics are ineligible for a top nine pick in 2025. White Sox are picking fifth this year because they have a top six pick and they're a large market team. They are ineligible for a lottery pick next year. The A's have had back-to-back top six picks, and they're a small market team, but they can't have it in three consecutive years. It's too bad for the A's. Too bad for the A's. They can't catch a break. Um, not so sad for the White Sox. I don't care about them. Mets, Yankees, Padres were also ha- had fairly significant implications here for, for the Brewers, Cubs, and Twins. So basically, their situation was if they – if any of those three teams didn't secure a lottery spot. They dropped 10 spots because they exceeded the luxury tax by more than $40 million. So they had to get a top six pick or drop 10 spots. None of them did. They all dropped 10 spots. That pushed the Cubs up three spots um, and the Brewers and Twins up two. Um, And just to put kind of a dollar value on that, right? That's like 150 to 200,000 per slot. So it's a significant amount of money. Um, the Cubs are picking 14th, the Brewers are picking 17th, and the Twins are picking 21st in the first round. I like that part of the draft early days as kind of a value spot. Um, College pitching around that region is looking interesting. The catching demographic is looking interesting. There's solid college position player depth. Um, but that's kind of the headlines, and, and I think this is a useful point to, to interject this listener question for you. This is the second time, right, that we've had the lottery, and there has been drama in both. I would say especially this year. It was a big shock when the Twins moved up last year, but this year was absolutely ridiculous. Do you like the draft lottery? What are your thoughts now that we're in year two on kind of the format, the function, how it works, et cetera? Well, I- I'm, I'm a fan of there being a lottery so that you just don't get rewarded for being the worst. Right. I mean, that just, that, that's what I like about the NBA draft. Yeah. Too. 
Um, and they flatten the they flatten the odds in these lotteries now. So even if you're yep. the worst team, you're not getting better odds than say the third worst team. Mm-hmm. Um, the part that still remains to be seen is our teams actually is this going to change how teams behave at the major league level? And so I think that really is yeah the lottery part is fun. It, it creates a uh, poorly produced and a, and uh, a not show right. I mean that's what that's what you said. They got to work on that. It's really bad. And, I, and that's what I love about the NBA because it's like they'll open the envelope and then uh, what's her face is like the Detroit Pistons have moved into the top three. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like that's that's the drama. Yeah. And that, sure. that, that's cool. And they, then they put the guys on there. But I like the idea because it adds an event, right? And even if the winter meetings, nothing happens, you're going to get the draft lottery. You're going to get the rule five draft. Um, and so I, I do like it, but for this to really work, people need to understand it for one, right? And that's kind of the big question mark. Yeah. And two, it's got to change how teams behave because if the A's are going to continue to be terrible, even though they're dropping, it doesn't didn't really solve the problem that everybody kind of viewed as as their being. Yeah. Um, but I'm all about it because that just makes people talk about the draft, and that's fun. For sure, agree. Um, and I think like. The four, like the winners and losers of this draft lottery were all in the central divisions, right? Like, forget about the teams that made the playoffs for a second, Brewers and Twins, put them to one side, and the Cubs, who are kind of in the middle. The Royals and White Sox got hosed, especially the White Sox, I think, because this is a poor class, but it has a solid top three. And they had about a 50% chance of landing a top three pick, and they didn't, and they're at five. And, of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the prep and college season, but chances are they'll be drafting someone with significant question marks, and they do not have a shot at a top nine pick next year, which already – excuse me, when I say next year, I mean 2025. 2025 already projects to be a much more interesting draft, a much stronger draft. Um, And then contrast that with the Reds and the Guardians, who are absolutely blessed – by this draft lottery. So to give you an idea of like the ridiculousness of the production. So we said the Brewers got 17th, right? So, so they moved into a spot where they had an announced pick on the TV show and there was no one from the Brewers organization in the room. So that's how that worked then. So it was playoff teams being revealed first. Right. Yep. Yeah. There was no one from the Brewers there. So I was like, oh, the Brewers have the 17th pick. And everyone's just kind of like twiddling their thumbs while we move to the next pick. And it also moved at such a pace that it was hard to kind of get your bearings. I wish it would slow down a little bit. So did you know at that point that you're like, oh, these teams dropped? Yes. But but 98% of people were like. I mean, I would think so. Like we tried to, we definitely previewed that info, right, about the the Padres, Yankees, and um, and Mets, but like, I don't think ninety percent of casual base baseball fans know that, nor should they be expected to. And so, right. I feel like you could fold that into the production and have right. the folks narrating it at the beginning mention that at th- at first, right? That like, if teams that made the playoffs move up into the announced picks, that means X Y Z team is going to fall down. There's definitely a better way to do or it. Or just start at Real thirty. Confusing. Start at thirty. Sure. sure. So you start through, you're like, oh, the Rangers are picking sure. three. We do that. Okay, 29, 28, 27, 26. Oh, now we have the whatever team, the Yankees. Yeah. That means they didn't make the lot. Yeah, that would be better. That's and a great idea. I think that that's that solves the problem. Because then Someone if the writes Yankees, to Manfred and let them know Jeremy's suggestion. I like Right, it. but if the Yankees don't show up 10 picks later, and all of a sudden it's like the Yankees have moved up in the ladder. Right. I think that's right. great. I think you know what we should do it. Just you and me. Just we'll, we'll <laughs> on this it. show, I like it. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so the other part of the draft then are the comp picks. Yes. Which again, maybe some big, big baseball fans don't understand, and maybe it's a little misleading because we talked last week about Sonny Gray signing with another team and the mm-hmm. Twins getting a comp pick, right? Only these are different. So the Twins secure a comp pick after the first round because Sonny Gray left. Mm -hmm. But a while back, I don't even know how many years, 10 years or so uh, or so ago, MLB decided that they would reward revenue receivers, small market teams, right, with 
uh, an extra pick. And the way that I've understood it is if you pick in round A one year, then you pick in round B the next year. And if you pick in round B, then you pick round B. Now, the order of those six or seven teams in each round could change, right? But you just flip from year to year. So I think that's pretty much how it works, but I actually don't think that's officially what it is, right? So what they say in their literature, which is not that easy to find, by the way. Okay is that they have a special formula to determine where your comp pick is going to fall that is based on your winning percentage from the previous year, your market size, and a couple of other factors. Okay. So the reality is, the reality is that as far back as like the last five years, I want to say, and if we remove 2020, which was a shortened draft anyway, um, and I think the Twins lost a pick that year. Um, anyway, regardless, the Twins have alternated back and forth um, for the last handful of years. So operationally, I think you're you're spot on with Watchers. Because I think it, when it started, there was 12 teams. Six got A, six got B. And then at some point, a 13th team was added. And I think we're still at 13. Okay. Um, now, these are the only picks that can be traded. Okay. Love which that. Which is cool. That, that's, that's cool. I think more teams picks should do that traded. more. Well, the Twins traded theirs um, that they received. I can't remember what year. But they have traded They have traded this pick. I, I think they traded it maybe like in the Phil Hughes to the Padres deal. Theo could probably look that up. But um, – you, you basically they announced it. The Twins, uh, Twins and Brewers receive one each. Okay. Cubs because they're Chicago, they don't. Uh, Brewers and Twins who drafted in comp round A last year will now pick in comp round B. Okay. Uh, Brewers pick second. Twins pick fourth. Comp round A is after the first round. After the other comp picks, comp round B is after the second round. Mm -hmm. After the, the second round picks, but with all the shuffling of player changes, teams dropping. Um, where these picks end up actually isn't going to be determined until who knows when, when all the, when all the dust settles. Um, but that's how it works. So, I mean, I anticipated there would be a, a comp B pick for both those yeah. teams. We I would be that. more surprised as if the, uh, if the twins like didn't get a pick one year, you know what I mean? Like, for sure. No, I, I don't think that's even a possibility. So I dig it. Um, the one team that I think the Cardinals usually get a pick, which surprises me because they don't seem like they're a small market mm. team. Um, but that's just me. So uh, it's cool. I, I I like it because it benefits the team that I watch the draft for the most. Um, so it's, it's cool. But it's different than the comp picks for free agents. Yes. Critically. Um, producer the L I was coming through says, Twins did send a competitive balance round B pick in 2018 to the Padres for Phil Hughes with Phil Hughes for a guy named Janikson Villa Lobo. If you remember him, that's like, that's a you thing. I don't, do you remember him? Uh, I think he was a catcher. Okay. And I don't think he uh, stuck around too long. I could, right be, I could be wrong about that. <laughs> right on. Okay. So yeah, man, I look these, I agree with you a hundred percent. We could, build such a more cohesive draft community if this information was presented more clearly to folks. I really do feel like MLB could do a much better job with that of kind of demystifying some of these things for people um, because it's hella confusing. So here, here's the last thing about the draft lottery, right? Which I think this is what most folks are going to be interested in, which is what does any of this mean in terms of dollars and picks for my team? So what I thought we might do is a kind of cap this conversation is quickly walk through for the twins, Brewers, and Cubs, what picks they have and roughly what slot that's going to equate to within like the top 80. Um, and I think the top 80 is a good proxy because that generally brings us through the end of comp B um, so, so top 70, top 80. So mm -hmm. we'll do a quick recap. And then I got some questions for you about kind of who you think is best positioned um, in this draft. So we're, we're going to go from like draft richest to draft poorest here, right? So draft richest is the twins. 
They have the 21st overall pick. That's worth about three. Po- These are all 2023 slots. They'll go up this year. But 21st pick, that's about 3.6 million. 33rd pick, that's a comp pick for Gray. That's worth about two and a half. Their second round pick is going to be somewhere in the late 50s. That's worth about 1.4. And their comp B pick, which is going to be somewhere in the mid 60s, is around 1.1. So the Twins have four picks in the top 70 with about 8.6 million total slot for those four picks. So 2.15 million per pick. Brewers have the second most at present. Um, They pick 17th in the first round. That's worth 4.1. Their second round pick is going to be in the mid 50s, a little ahead of the Twins. That's 1.5. Their comp B pick is going to be worth just slightly more than the Twins at around 1.2. So the Brewers have three picks in the top 70-ish to the Twins four. And they have 6.8 million in slot approximately compared to the twins 8.6. So you already see here, right? Like the difference that the Sonny Gray qualifying offer pick makes that leapfrogs the twins over the brewers um, who, who, you know, are picking higher than them. Um, So it's going to be a big boon to the twins. And then last at the moment, but this will change the Cubs, they pick 14th overall. That's worth 4.6 million. Their second round pick will be in the early 50s. That'll be worth about 1.6. They have two top 70 picks currently for about 6.2, but they're going to add a comp pick for losing Cody Bellinger after he rejected his qualifying offer, assuming he signs elsewhere. That pick will be around 70th overall. It'll be worth around a million dollars. So that would take the Cubs to 7.2 million with three picks in the top 70. So they would slightly eclipse what the Brewers have. Um, and then, go, go ahead. I, and I think the number is usually like between 8 and 10% that these increase mm-hmm. right every year. So I think, you know, when we say 8.6 for the Twins, we can probably guess it's going to be more yeah. like 9.4 to 9.5. Yep. But it, that, that'll that increase for everybody. But that's kind of the, the standard from year to year. Yep, you're spot on. I think last year it was like exactly nine, so exactly right in the middle of what you just said. So let me ask you this question, then we'll come back to the Guardians because I do think they're worth mentioning in a second, but I want to skip down. Out of the Twins, Brewers, and Cubs, who do you think is best positioned draft-wise at this moment going into 2024? So what what you just kind of recapped was the the first round or the first day of picks, right? Yep. And so I think when you have the most picks on day one, especially when you're all drafting in the second half of the first round, Mm -hmm. um, the team that has the most opportunities is the team that probably has the best situation. And so I'd say the twins out of these three teams kind of easily because they're going to get two picks in the top 30-ish. they're top 33. They're going to get another one of the 50s. They're going to get another one of the 60s. They're going to get four picks, and they're going to have more financial f- flexibility. So yep. for me, it's it's the Twins easily. Uh, and then the Brewers will end up probably – well, they're going to be about the same. So um, I like I like the Twins situation the most just because they have the most chances to, to add talent to their organization. Yep. And I think that is relevant, right? There's kind of like two considerations here that I think are worth mentioning. One is just like straight dollars, but there's also a piece around access to talent and how important that is, right? And so the Cubs pick 14th, the Twins pick 21st. Depending on the draft year, the caliber of talent available, those two picks could look significantly different. I think if I had to bet today, I would suggest that it would look pretty similar, picks 14 through 21 this year. Um, And so I think that adds credence to your thought that the Twins are in the best spot because um, they literally have the the most picks. And and I think financial flexibility is going to be less important with a, a pretty weak looking prep class, which is what we're looking at in 2024. Yeah. And I, I would guess that the twins will, you know, when they stack their board, they'll probably, you know, whoever, and I'm not going to, I'm just throwing numbers out, but if they have a top 15, I I'm guessing they get one of those guys. Mm-hmm. 
right? Because just how the, the the things work out and how teams. When we look at some of the guys that dropped into the twenties last year, I think you especially would have been elated to get a handful oh, of yeah. those guys. You thought would have never made it that far. Oh yeah. And all of a sudden things get wonky. There's 20 chances for things to get wonky before you pick at 21. Yep. And uh, and I think that bodes well for the the team sitting there even in a in a weaker draft class. For sure, agree. So I do. I got one more. One more kind of team to throw out there that I think is relevant, right, for our central division conversations. Um, and then I got a, a question on them. So the Guardians, I think, are, are really worth mentioning here because they ran into an insane set of circumstances on Tuesday. Not only did they move up to the number one overall pick, that jump alone netted them over $4 million in additional draft bonus pool money. That is absolutely nutty money. They also were awarded a comp A pick, which is going to be worth another two and a half million or so. Now, not that that's necessarily surprising, but you don't know until you know with the comp picks. So in one day, the Guardians added six and a half million to their bonus pool. They, they added as much in a day as some teams might have in their entire pool if they lost picks. Um, and so I say that to say, make no mistake, the Guardians run this draft financially. They are going to have so much money to spend compared to most teams. They can control and do what they want to do. And so my question to you is, although the answer might be different in six months when we've had some games played. If you're a Twins fan or if you're a Cubs and Brewers fan, the same question goes for the Reds, right? Because they're in a similar boat. Does the Guardians and Reds, like, massive level of financial capital worry you? I'm going to answer your question, then I'm going to ask you a question. It's not okay. on here. Um, the financial capital does not worry me, not even a little bit. Um Having that money available is nice, and it allows the Guardians to to get creative, sure. Um, but they've been, over the course of a handful of years, one of arguably the top three or four teams in developing pitching. Mm -hmm. And they can't get out of their own way and just make the playoffs in a, in a division that's been pretty bad, right? Um, but they're going to get to add prospects, and, and I think when you're not good, that's something that you deserve to do. But there's there's a whole big space to clear between having massive financial capital and all of a sudden teams are going to worry about the Guardians. For and sure. I think that that's where we're at. Now, the Reds, I think, are different because they have a super talented pool of younger players, right? Prospects, guys that have just recently made it to the majors. Uh, but in this particular draft, if it's weaker and they're better – does this maybe skew their ideas from taking a ceiling dude to taking a he could maybe help us in September type guy? Hmm. Right, and I, and that's just that's totally speculation. But we saw a player join uh, the Angels for the for the stretch run, and then we saw other guys get drafted right around him that aren't going to play in the major leagues for five or six years. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't know if that's something that the Reds would think, but. If, if you're debating between the, the guy that's far away and the guy that can help quicker, maybe that, that changes things. So either way, uh, when the Nationals got to go Strasburg, Harper, that that would have given teams reasons to worry, yeah. right? The greatest pitching prospect in a long time, the greatest baseball prospect in forever, and it took them until Harper left to win a World Series. And nobody even that we'll talk about in the next year is anywhere close to, to that level of prospect. Absolutely. So uh, the financial capital doesn't, doesn't necessarily move my needle, but here's my question for you. Okay. Cleveland historically has been maybe not cheap, but they are very financially, we'll call it responsible. You don't have to call it responsible, but, but they'll, they'll, they, <laughs> they maybe pinch their pennies, yeah. right? If you're walking into 2024 and you're like, okay, here's what we have going on. We have a payroll that's going to be X amount of dollars. And then all of a sudden, because it's not like Major League provides you with this bonus pool money, right? Now all of a sudden, you're told, hey, you just won the lottery. 
you have $4 million to spend of your own money. Do you think that changes their, like their payroll plans from a perspective of, Hey, we're going to try to keep our payroll at 125. I'm just making that number up 125. And we know our draft pool is going to be X amount of dollars. Now all of a sudden our, our draft pool is $4 million. Are we saying, Ooh, yeah. GM, you now have $4 million less to spend on your major league roster because we just lucked into the pick. I don't think anything is going to impact the, the Guardians payroll. I, I think um, who is there? Is Zach Meisel, their beat reporter for The Athletic, had a piece in the last week or so that essentially said, and this ties into both the TV situation for them um, that a number of teams, including the twins are facing um, basically said that they can expect their Theo is the best man. He's linked it in the chat, basically suggested their payroll is going to remain the same. And the guardians payroll to be clear, dude, I think it's like 83 million in 2023 and the forecast for, uh, excuse me, last season and the forecast for 2024 is right around the same being around 85 million. And so I don't think anything is really going to impact their plans and how they spend until there is greater resolution for all of these teams that are cresting this TV situation wave that the Twins, Guardians, even the Rangers, I guess, are about to be in the midst of that and they just won a World Series. But that, but that's my whole point. Like now all of a sudden their bonus pool went you just said they added six and a half million to their bonus pool, which is six and a half million dollars that they weren't necessarily planning to spend on the draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, they knew the comp pick was coming, right? But the four million, which is probably gonna be four and a half million that they got for the first pick. Like, is this the year that a team's like, yeah, we're not gonna even spend close to our bonus pool? We're gonna no way, no, nope. because all of the no way. I'm just saying. Here's why. Because all of those super frugal teams are not just about, not necessarily about pinching pennies, they're about spending money efficiently. And the amateur draft is the second most efficient way you can get talent into your organization. I think the first most efficient way being in the national signings in the January, the January period. So if I, I could be misremembering this, but I think I'm correct in saying that Cleveland last year was one of the teams that spent exactly their 5% overage on the 2023 okay. bonus pool. So I would ex actually expect the opposite. I would expect them to lean into the extra money, take the 5% extra, go ham, and okay. get as much talent as they possibly can um, now. And 5%. But, 5% too of extra 4 14 million. 14 million is going to be more money. Yeah. That's it's good gonna be that. a lot, man. I still doesn't. I still not. I'm not worried about it. I think that's fair, 100. percent And yeah, I think with both of these teams, and like this is a conversation that ex expands to other teams, like the Orioles too, right? Who have this like incredible young core of talent. Like, are they going to spend enough money to take advantage of that? And like, I think Cincinnati is closer to a Baltimore than Cleveland is. Cle Cleveland is such a like middling roster right now, especially offensively. I have just like serious doubts about Cleveland, like as a threat in the central, I think the tigers are going to be much more of a significant factor in the next five years. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's a draft lottery. Um, we will, Obviously, get much more into that as we go kind of down the road here, finalize bonus pools, start to get into player evals, all of that stuff in the new year when the games start. The other significant event from the winter meetings was capped off by the Rule 5 draft. We've spent a couple of weeks um, kind of previewing who teams could select, who teams could lose. I feel like the Rule 5 draft often ends up being much ado about nothing. So <laughs> let's start with the major league portion. The Brewers, Cubs, and Twins all didn't lose anybody. They all didn't take anybody either. So I guess my first question, Jeremy, is do we get too caught up in analyzing who might get selected ahead of the Rule 5 draft every year? 100%. 
Um, I think teams have gotten a lot smarter about how to manage their roster, how to manage yeah. their prospects. And even though it's a 26 man roster, um, it's just hard to bury a not ready prospect on your roster for a year. And I think teams are, are realizing that like there's so much information out there, right? That you would have to completely miss on one of your own players to have him be good enough then to stick on a major league roster. And it's happened, you know, with, with the extra year protection, like you just have that much more information. And so that's why I think it, it doesn't necessarily happen. And, and teams know because you talk so much and that's why you see all these deals as the, as the rosters are getting finalized, you know, last month, um, because you know, teams are calling, right? If you have someone that might be exposed, it's mm-hmm. easier to just trade for them, add them to the 40 man roster and not have to deal with all the, the, you know, stipulations of being a rule five pick was we'll add them, we'll add them to the roster. Now we'll have three options on them. And I think teams have just become more willing to do that. We'll give you a little something instead of the cash. Um, and so it, it's, it, to me, it's like if the twins weren't taking calls on Deshaun Kiersey and Chris Williams and Anthony Prado, they probably weren't going to get picked. Yep. And that's why they don't add them. Yep. I agree. Uh, Producer Theos has 37.1 million in committed guaranteed contracts. I assume that's the Guardians. That's wild. Um, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think like, and if you look at, if you look at the prospects that we talked about that you gave Twins guys as an example, Kiersey, half a, half a season of success as like a 25, 26 year old at double A and then struggle when he got to St. Paul, Prado, struggled at double A, then suddenly turned it on and started mashing at St. Paul, but not exactly like an established track record of success, right? And so I think if we step back from our desire to have baseball talk for five seconds, it's actually pretty unlikely that any of those guys would have been picked. Um, Also worth noting, I think that like this rule five class was kind of perceived as like weaker than a typical year because this one kind of stemmed from the 2020 draft class which as we say about once a month on this show was shortened to five rounds because of the the pandemic and so just much less talent brought into into the league that year so does that mean that does that mean the 2026 rule five draft is going to be loaded i guess i guess well we'll we'll have to see how this draft um which will probably be long after we have stopped doing this podcast. Um, no, you don't know. All right. So rule five, I'm going to do, we'll do like a lightning fast recap, right? Um, just for the sake of thoroughness. And then any of the names that catch your eye, um, you're, you're going to kind of highlight for us. So we'll go quickly team by team brewers um, in the minor league portion, the Royal selected Joe Gray, the first pick of the first round. The Brewers did not select anyone in the minor league phase, so they lost one player. The Cubs uh, lost quite a few guys. Diamondback selected Andy Weber, a second baseman in the second round. Red selected Levi Jordan, a shortstop in the third round. Marlins selected Adam Lasky, left-handed pitcher in the fourth round. And the Twins selected Sheldon Reed, a right-handed pitcher from the Cubs. The Cubs made one selection, selecting second baseman Hayden Cantrell in the second round from the Giants. And then the Twins, they don't lose lose anyone, man. They don't lose anyone in the major league portion. They don't lose anyone in the minor league portion. They did make four selections in the minor league portion. They selected left-handed pitcher Rafael Marcano in the first round from the Phillies, catcher Rafael Escalante in the second round from Pittsburgh, Infielder Angel De Rosario in the third round from Toronto, and then right-handed pitcher Sheldon Reed, the aforementioned, in the fourth round from the Cubs. Any of these guys noteworthy, um, interest you at all, or do you think most of these guys are just org depth that, that were selected in the, the minor league portion? Yeah, I think that you know for any team – if you're taking guys in the minor league portion of the rule five draft, it's almost always about depth, right? 
you have a need at whatever position and, and you're trying to, to help fill that need. The mm -hmm. acquisition cost in the minor league portion is low. It used to be twelve million, excuse me, twelve thousand for AAA, <laughs> eight million for double A, but they did away with the double A draft. So I'm not sure if it's still twelve K or if it's ten K or you know, whatever it is. Acquisition cost is low. Peanuts uh, for a major league team, right? And you get to keep these guys until they're free agents, right? So mm -hmm. probably another two or three years. Um, you take guys because you like them more than other teams, right? Um, and so I think that the Twins probably you know, had a, had a list of, I don't know how many guys, say 20 guys, 15 guys, and they're like, hey, yeah, we, you know, we'd like to add these guys. Some of the guys get taken off. Um, obviously, Marcano is a lefty, which counts for something. He's breathing, which counts for something. <laughs> and he strikes guys out. And so he's, he's kind of moved through as a starter, Mm -hmm. But when you're a lefty and you can strike guys out as a starter, I feel like there's a chance you could That's be valuable. something as a as a relief pitcher, or you know if you can continue to start. Um, but there was a number of other teams that had the opportunity to take him and passed. Yep. The Phillies had an opportunity to keep him and didn't. Uh, and this is this is a uh, on their AAA reserve roster, right? So you have 40 on your on your major league roster, and you have 40 on your AAA roster. And when they were announcing the roster numbers. Did you hear that? Like, nope. It was, it was, there was huge room. Like, there was so much room on some of these rosters. And I'm like, why wouldn't you put 38 guys or 39 guys? And so uh, I just, I think it's, it's a lot of depth start, but there's, there's value in being a lefty, right? There's, there's, a sure. value, right? there's value in being a, in a catcher. And so you can never have enough depth at those positions. And the Twins lost, you know, their second pick was a, a catcher. They lost some minor league free agents that were catchers. So I think this is just an opportunity to add depth. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, these four selections don't really move the needle as a prospect watcher or as a Twins fan. Yeah. Uh, but sure. with all that being said, we've spent time just recently talking about the last minor league pick of last year's draft, right? And the Brewers mm -hmm. just traded for him and gave him a 40-year man spot. And now we're going to give him an opportunity to start. So um, that's not to, so it's not to say these guys don't have a shot, but it's it's a they're, they're long shots. The Twins picked four guys last year. Two of them are still in the organization. One played pretty well. Two got cut midseason. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's just it's kind of scrap heap stuff and, and organizational depth, but still fun. Certainly fun. Still fun. Some new names to keep an eye on. Um, yeah, a pretty low key Rule Five draft overall. I would say. Um, across the board, not just Brewers, Cubs, Twins. Let's round out with some listener questions, man. Um, so some people sent some stuff in. Uh, I'm going to put the first one to you. Um, th these are all kind of geared towards the draft lottery and 2024 draft. So Cody Shulman, uh Twins Daily contributor, does the twin selecting at 21 – and I think he's alluding to them moving up a couple of spots, right? Um, and, and getting a little more money, increase their chance of taking a flyer on a prep arm or a high school position player, or does having a later pick increase their chance of taking a safe bet? That's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the drafting team, if you look at how they've done things in the past, tell, gives you a little idea. Um, you know, the Twins drafted – a high school arm and Chase Petty a handful of years ago, later in the first round, mm -hmm. they drafted Aaron Sabato, uh, college hitter, later in the first round. I think they've they've gone that demographic the most. Um, but then you have draft years where guys fall, right? Kyle Gibson falling to the Twins. That wasn't necessarily something that I think a lot of people saw. I think it gives them an opportunity, moving up from twenty three to twenty one gives them an opportunity, a better opportunity to take a guy that falls, right? For sure. Because um, it's two, pot, two spots quicker than if you're drafting at 23. Um, depending on how and, – and we haven't – the baseball season, the college baseball, the prep season hasn't started yet. Um, but there's going to be kind of tiers to things, and I think – you know, the, the and there's going to be price tags, and the Twins are going to be able to maybe float guys to 21 because they have that Sunny Gray pick. Yeah. Um, but there's so many variables here that I don't think you can 
you know, rightfully say, oh yeah, because they moved up, that makes them more likely to do this or that. Um, it just gives them the chance to take the best player on their board two picks earlier. And I think that's that's what you want out of a team that's really drafted really well over the last really well. Three years. really, really well. It's I, I love being able to say that. I agree completely. And I agree. Like, I think you're absolutely spot on. Like, I think the way to look at it is this extra money and extra picks gives you flexibility. Mm-hmm. The twins now have more flexibility courtesy of four day one picks. The the most slot money of any of the teams that we talk about regularly on this podcast. And so as the process evolves, as we start getting to know players, seeing how they develop, seeing what the seasons look like, <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to have the opportunity to offer more money to a guy if they feel like he's a good fit um, and, and the possibility of floating someone down, like you said. So I think that's spot on. It's going to be what's going to be fun because it's pick 21 and not necessarily a higher pick like the Twins had last year. I think we felt the same way about how the Twins should handle last year's draft, right? Maybe you felt different about if it wasn't Jenkins, but we're both going to have a handful of guys that we would love for the Twins to draft at 21, and they're probably not going to be the same. No, they're not. They're definitely not. That's going to make this more fun. Looking forward to it. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, one more question from FTL Nova Kid. He asks 20, 2023 draft class seems miles better than 2024. Is it safe to say that's the case? I think it is. Um, it's dangerous making leaps right before a game has been played, but I do think you tend to get a decent idea of what draft demographics look like plenty in advance. And I would say, especially the prep class, this, the prep class in 2023 was special. It was really, really good. Um, I do think the prep class in 2024 is looking pretty uninteresting at the moment. Um, so I, I do think that's fairly safe to say. Um, obviously there are going to be guys that kind of rise to the top, but here's, I think how we kind of put it after some twins fans were bummed out that the guardians got the number one pick. I don't think. So I think if the guardians chose today, they would be selecting between three guys at the moment. Uh, first baseman, Nick Kurtz out of wake forest. They're all, all college hitters, uh, a second baseman, um, an Australian second baseman, Travis Bazana out of Oregon State, and then J.J. Weatherholt, who's a, a second baseman who plays for West Virginia. I don't think any of those guys is getting in the top five last year. Um, right. I mean, you're talking about adding a, maybe a top 50 global prospect. Maybe. Yeah, um, that's not great. And that's, that's, okay. that's how these drafts work, right? And I think, you know – you say well, we got to be careful because there hasn't been a game played yet. Right. But Absolutely. every everybody was getting scouted last year. Everybody was getting scouted, and scouts they they recognized two years ago that oh, there's a lot of guys in, that are draft eligible next year, mm-hmm. right? And so maybe that kind of over overshadowed things a little bit. But they weren't going to games last year and then leaving saying. Yeah, but that guy. Yep. And that's why it feels like there's just this huge wide gap because that's people left talking about 2023, not talking about 2024, and they talk to each other and they all are in agreement. So there's going to be guys that show up, right? I mean, there's going to be there's going to be pitchers that come back and it's like sure. well, that guy looks different. There's going to be hitters, um, and so there's gonna there's going to be some guys that totally float to the top, but the top five last year at this time that was a special top, top five. Yeah, man, it was, it was different. Plus, plus Dolander, who was a part of that early in the process as well, for sure. Right. And you're right. We're playing a dangerous game, but I think, yeah, like the headlines are the prep class is down. College pitching is really interesting to me, but we said the same thing before last season. And a lot of it was kind of meh during the season. Catching is better. 
college position player depth is solid, evidenced by the guys that are sitting there at the top. But what you'll notice is a lot of those guys are, do not play premium defensive positions, like not a ton of shortstops, not a ton of like really athletic, like center field projecting guys. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to figure out as we get through the process here. The fact that there's a first baseman. There's a lot of first basemen. To go first overall. You don't see college hitting first baseman going top 10 and now they're like, that's crazy. It's crazy. I'm like tempted to pull up the consensus board just to talk positions, but we should save that for another day. Fair. Um, Fair. Let's talk about next week though, real quick. Cause that kind of does us for today. Um, and the rule five draft was like a nice end point of the winter meetings. Um, and so we're really kind of into the, the winter, although it's like 60 degrees in Minnesota today, we're into like the winter of the off season. Now, hopefully news will pick up. I think we're still kind of committed to any big trades. We're going to try and hop on and break those down for like 20, 30 minutes, just from like a prospect perspective. Right. Um, but excited to start welcoming some guests onto the show starting next week and one thing we figured we'd like to do is take a really in-depth dive into each organization's farm system but with a guest because folks have heard us talk about these organizations and these guys enough they're sick and tired of us man it's true so we're going to kick off next week with the twins and excited to share that we're going to have none other than Tom Froming. Um, I feel like who's kind of like the OG of like twins, Twitter video content, who's going to come be on with us next week. Mr. Mr. Twin, Mr. Twin YouTube himself, Theo says in the chat. So he's going to be on with us next week. We're going to take a big old deep dive into the Twins minor league system, get a ton of his thoughts. We'll put out the call for questions. Um, and we will also have guests coming up in the near future to dig into the Cubs and Brewer systems, um, which are obviously super intriguing. So um, excited to, to have some guests on here in the next month. Um, as always, you can support the show um, by giving us retweets, downloading, any positive reviews on your podcast platform of choice are greatly and warmly appreciated. Um, we've had we've had some really some steady progress on our numbers over the past couple of months. So I really appreciate you guys checking us out, sending in questions for all the fun engagement. Um, until next week, we'll catch you guys later. So long.